Okay, question one. Greg wants to reduce the amount of coffee he drinks each day. He starts taking frequency data on the number of cups of coffee he drinks. On Monday, he drank four cups. On Tuesday, he drank three cups. On Wednesday, he drank three cups. On Thursday, he drank four cups. How many cups per day did Greg drink on average? I know this sounds like a math word problem that you did, you know, in high school um, or elementary school, but it's what we're going to do um, as RVTs when we need to find averages, okay? Um, in order to write good behavior plans and good interventions, we need to know where to start. And that's what Greg is doing. He needs to find the average amount of coffee he drinks per week in order to decrease that number, okay? So what he did, he took frequency data on the cups. And what did he get? What was his average? So how do we find an average? We just add up all of our data points, okay? All of the data we take the total data, and then divide it by the number of data points, right? So we take four plus four is eight, eight plus three is 11, 11 plus three is 14. We have four data points. We divide 14 divided by four. And what do we get? Three and a half, okay? So average doesn't change um, on the RBT exam or as an RBT, simple basic math. Um, don't worry, the exam gives you paper. It gives you a calculator. You won't be doing anything in your head, okay? All you need to do is find the average, okay? It's a very important skill to have as an RBT. Okay? You're gonna be looking at averages and rates quite a bit. So they might test you on this. And if they do, you should be ready. Every Sunday after lunch, Lisa talks to her mom. At first, Lisa only called her mom. Now on Sundays after lunch, Lisa will call her mom, text her mom, or drive to her mom's house to see her in person. In terms of contacting her mom, Lisa is demonstrating what? So what is Lisa doing? She's reaching out to her mom, right? Now, looking at our answer choices, okay, this is some sort of generalization question, right? Because you should know there's no prompting involved, there's no avoidance involved. So we're looking at either their stimulus generalization or response generalization. And what is our key when we're talking about stimulus generalization and response generalization? With stimulus generalization, we're looking at how many responses? We're looking at one response generalized across multiple stimulus stimuli. With response generalization, we're looking at several multiple responses, right, across one stimulus, okay? So keep that in mind and ask yourself in this situation, how many responses are we looking at? Well, Lisa calls her mom, Lisa texts her mom, and Lisa drives to see her mom in person. So we have three responses, okay? And the stimulus is Sunday after lunch, right? Whatever Sunday after lunch is to Lisa, that's the stimulus and response, okay? She can contact her mom in a variety of ways. She's gone from just calling her, okay? To generalizing that response, okay? In response to it being Sunday after lunch. So again, stimulus generalization, we're looking at a single response generalized across multiple stimuli. Response generalization, we're looking at one stimulus that evokes several responses. And again, in this case, there's three different responses we're looking at for Lisa. Therefore, this is response generalization. Okay, graphing question. Don't be intimidated by math questions. Don't be intimidated by graphing questions. They're all very straightforward, okay? This one is gonna do a little thinking on your part. So based on the graph below, what was the rate of the client screaming per hour for data point five? All right, so a lot going on here, right? We need the rate of the client screaming per hour, okay? Data point five. So start with your data point, right? What is our data point? Data point five, okay? We go to data point five and we see our behavior is eight. So it happened eight times. Okay, we need the rate per hour. So if we look at our x-axis, sessions were three hours long. So what do we know? We know the client screamed eight times during the session. Sessions are three hours. So if we're looking for the rate per hour, what do we need to find? We need to find eight time, eight screaming behaviors, okay, across three hours. And how do you find that? All you're gonna do is divide this number, eight your behavior, okay, by your total time, which is three hours, 
right? And what are you going to get? 2.67, okay? So the rate of the client screaming per hour is 2.67. Eight divided by three, okay? 2.67. Remember, rate is frequency over time. Our frequency is eight. Our time is three. We divide that and we get 2.67 is the rate. Again, very simple calculation, very straightforward calculation. It just takes a couple times of practice, okay? And understanding the concept behind rate, just like the concept behind average, okay? And you'll never miss these questions. These questions should be layups. They should be automatic corrects, okay? Don't get caught not knowing how to do these simple rate calculations or average calculations. Your client is on a token economy with an FR2 schedule requirement. After supervision, your BCBA instructs you to move the client to a VR5 schedule. The next three sessions, your client's response rate decreases significantly. Based on the entry choices below, what is the best possible explanation for this? Interesting, okay? So if you've been studying and if you're well-versed by now in your task list, you should immediately know the answer, okay? This is one of those questions on the exam that you read the question stem and you don't even need to read the answer choices because you just already know the answer, okay? But if you don't, let's go through it, right? So what happened? You're on an FR2 schedule, right? Pretty thick reinforcement schedule. You're giving a lot of reinforcement very quickly. And then all of a sudden you move to a VR5 schedule, a variable ratio five schedule. You've, you've really thinned out the reinforcement schedule, okay? You're going from a lot of reinforcement on that FR2 to a VR5 where it's much more difficult for your client to earn that reinforcement, okay? And what happens? Your client stops responding. What is that called? Okay, this is a very specific term. A, the tasks are too hard. We would never use this as a reason for our client not responding, okay? Too hard is a, is a construct, right? Um, it doesn't tell us anything. We're making assumptions, okay? Especially given the information in this question, which clearly point us to a correct answer, A is incorrect. B, your client doesn't like the reinforcer anymore. Again, there's no reinforcer mentioned in the question. Regardless, okay, not liking something, again, is a construct, right? We, we don't judge like versus like, right? That's preference assessment to begin with, but all we judge reinforcers by is what, how does it affect the behavior, okay? And there's nothing about the behavior in here and nothing about reinforcers. So B is wrong. C, a token economy is not effective with the VR schedule. That is definitely wrong because the VR is actually the most, um, the strongest basic reinforcement schedule. It's the one that maintains behavior the best. It's the hardest to extinguish, okay? So C is incorrect. That leaves us with D. Your client is experiencing ratio strain and that's the magic term. This is what ratio strain is. When you faded your reinforcement too quickly, and as a result, that client stops responding, okay? You stop seeing the behavior, you stop seeing the skill you want to see, okay? You are experiencing ratio strain. You've gone too quickly from an FR2 to a VR5. You now need to dial it back some, okay, to get responding back on track. So ratio strain, this is what ratio strain is. Our answer is D. Every building on campus requires a programmed key card for entry. Your key card works only on the rooms that you've been given access. If you try your key card on rooms that you don't have access, the door will not unlock and you will be denied entry. What best describes this scenario? Okay, again, a question that you might read and immediately know the answer, okay? This is a real life scenario. We're not talking about working with clients or anything like that. Um, so it's good because application questions are what you need to be good at on the RBT exam. In this case, you have a key card, and on door A, if you scan your key card, the door unlocks. Or on door B, if you scan your key card, you are denied, the door does not unlock. So what is happening? Well, you're receiving reinforcement from door A. Door B is putting your behavior on extinction. What does that sound like? Not shaping, okay? You already know how to do the behavior, which is scanning the key card, okay? You're just receiving reinforcement for one stimulus, and not the other. Okay. If we had discrimination as an option, right? Discrimination would be a pretty good option, but we also have what? We have B, differential reinforcement. What is differential reinforcement? Differential reinforcement is reinforcing one behavior 
putting other behaviors on extinction. <clears throat> and that's what the door is doing to you, right? If you scan door A, you get it, you get reinforcement. If you scan door B, you don't, you eventually learn you can only go to door A. Okay. You're being differentially reinforced by the doors. What about VR1 schedule of reinforcement? No, because it doesn't matter how many times you scan your key card on door B, you're never going to be able to get in. You're never going to receive reinforcement. And then D, not enough information. Nope, there's plenty of information here. Okay. You should know this is differential reinforcement. It's a very solid example of differential reinforcement. Our answer is B. Ben works with a 16-year-old client who communicates at a typical level when compared to his peers his age. However, when Ben takes his client out on community-based interventions, Ben insists on ordering food for his client and communicating with community helpers for his client. Based on the given information, Ben is failing to do what? Okay, so what do we know? We know the 16-year-old communicates at a very typical level, okay? In ABA, okay, in development, we're often comparing um, kids to the typically developing milestones, right? Um, we're trying, this is a socially valid way to do it. Um, you want to compare, uh, you know, any deficit increase, right, to a more typical developing child, right? That's the, uh, the, the scale we go off of. So if this 16-year-old client communicates at a typical level of a 16-year-old, okay, we have to believe that he, he could order food for himself and he can communicate with community helpers for himself. Ben insisting on doing these things that a 16-year-old should be able to do, especially with strong communication skills, what is he doing? Is he failing to maintain client dignity? dignity? Yes, right? He's treating a 16-year-old like you wouldn't treat a typical 16-year-old. If you have a typical 16-year-old who's able to communicate for themselves, you're going to let them speak for themselves, right? You're going to let them advocate for themselves. You're going to let them order food. You're going to let them communicate with uh, store clerks, waiters, and community helpers as they need to. You're not going to step in and start doing these things for them, right? because it's kind of humiliating, it's a little degrading, okay? You're not giving the 16-year-old the dignity he deserves, okay? And that's what Ben is doing here, right? The 16-year-old who can communicate should be doing these things on his own. A is our answer, great answer. Let's read all the answer choices. All questions, read all answer choices. B, avoid dual relationships. No, okay, dual relationships. Or crossing the line between personal and professional, nothing like that is going on. This is a very standard uh, intervention procedure. C, abide by all legal and regulatory requirements. Based on information, Ben has not broken any laws. He has not violated any regulatory requirements. Okay, so Ben is in the clear for C. And then D, contact a supervisor with clinical concerns. It doesn't seem like Ben thinks he's doing anything wrong necessarily. There's no questions being raised. Okay, so D might be something Ben considers if he realizes he's, he's not maintaining this dignity. Okay, but D is not the best answer. A is our best answer. Ben is not maintaining his client dignity. He is not affording the, the client the respect they deserve. You and your best friend work on the same case together. One day while you're having drinks with your friend, she tells you that sometimes she will just let the client play video games all session when she doesn't feel like, quote, dealing with the behaviors, what should you do? Had the scenario play out, right? RBTs, we all have days where we're down or retired. We don't feel like working or doing what we're supposed to do. We don't want to deal with the behaviors. Not an uncommon scenario. However, you've been told this by your best friend, okay? So what do you do? What are you obligated to do? Remember, ethics are about doing what's right, okay? Doing what's best. Okay, even when it's difficult. You know if you report your best friend, okay, there might be consequences. But what is right? What's the right thing to do? Is it A, report your friend to the client's parents? No, okay. Th these are inner workings, right? You really want to go to somebody else besides the parents first. You shouldn't be reporting other RBTs to the parents at all. You always want to stick up for your team, stick up for your BCBA, okay? Um, you never want to be throwing anybody under the bus to the parents. 
B, report your friend to the authorities. No, she hasn't broken any laws, any, any policies, okay? So that's too harsh, right? We're looking for a good answer. That's not too harsh. C, do nothing. It isn't your business. Well, it is your business because you're on the case, okay? You have an obligation to the client to provide the best services possible. If you know that they're not getting the best services at times, you have an obligation to do something about that. That leaves us with D, report your friend to your supervisor. Yes, right? It might be difficult. It might be hard. You don't want to break your friend's trust, okay? But again, you have an obligation to the client to report them to the supervisor. Ethically, D is the right answer. Gina's client loves to throw his pencil on the ground for attention. He will generally laugh afterwards and then comply when told to pick it up. On Monday, it took the client two minutes to pick up the pencil after being told to pick it up. And on Wednesday, it took the client one minute to pick the pencil up after being told. What is Gina measuring? Okay, so pretty basic measurement question, right? Um, if you looked at your continuous measurement uh, task list items on the study guide, very easy, very straightforward. What is Gina measuring? Okay. So what do we know? We know from the, from the time Gina told your client to pick him up, pick up the pencil, it took two minutes to start. Again, on Wednesday, it took one minute to start. So the time between the SD and the start of the response is what? Is it IRT, frequency, latency, or momentary time sampling? We know that's latency. Again, SD is pick it up. Client takes two minutes to start picking it up. The latency is two minutes. On Wednesday, it was one minute. IRT is time in between behaviors. Frequency is count. Momentary time sampling is a discontinuous type of measurement, okay, where we're taking data at the end of an interval. None of that's happening. We are measuring latency, the time between the command of picking up the pencil and when that behavior actually starts. Which of the following reinforcement schedules represent continuous reinforcement? This is a super easy question, okay? There's gonna be questions on the exam that are complete layups, right? Where you should answer them in 10 seconds and move on. This is one of those. Because there's only one schedule that represents continuous reinforcement, okay? So that immediately eliminates A, B, and D. The only schedule that represents continuous reinforcement is FR1. Why is that? Because FR1, you reinforce for every occurrence of the target behavior or target response. That's continuous reinforcement. Every other reinforcement schedule is intermittent because not every response is being reinforced. The only answer here is C. When you get a question like this on the exam, if you've prepared properly, okay, you will get this question right in 15 seconds and you can move on. That's where you want to get to. That's the level you want to be at. Okay, finally, session notes. The client engaged in self-injurious behavior. The client swung an open hand toward his leg, repeatedly contacting the palm of his hand. A red mark was observed as a result of the behavior. What is the session note describing? So what are we doing here? Well, we're saying, you know, the client engages in this behavior. This is what the behavior looks like. Okay, this is what happens. This is what happens when the behavior occurs, and that's what that looks like. So if we're describing what something looks like, what are we describing? Are we describing the function? No, the function is why it's occurring. What are our four functions? Escape, tangible, attention, automatic sensory. We are not describing why the self-injurious behavior is happening. We're just describing what it looks like. And when we describe what behavior looks like, what are we describing? We're describing B, the topography, okay? Topography is what the behavior looks like. Function is why it occurs. Those two go hand in hand. They're both very important, okay? But you need another distinction. Function is why the behavior happened. Topography is what the behavior looks like. In this session note, we are describing what the behavior looks like. Not frequency, we have no frequency data here. And we have no antecedents. We have no idea what happens before this behavior. What happens after? We just know what the behavior looks like. Okay, hope you enjoyed. Uh, please like and subscribe if you did. Remember to check out all of our study materials. Uh, we have BCBA study materials coming soon. Be on the lookout for that. We're very excited. Other than that, keep working hard, keep sending me questions, and I will see you soon.